indeed, Franklin Roosevelt was missing. The man who helped weld the United Nations together as a fighting team and who worked to keep them united in the peace to come had died before he could see his dream come true. But his words were in every mind and heart. 25 years ago, American fighting men looked to the statesmen of the world to furnish the work of peace for which they fought and suffered. We failed them. We failed them then. We cannot fail them again and expect the world to survive again. President Truman, Roosevelt's friend and successor, opened the conference by radio from Washington. Delegates to the United Nations Conference on International Organizations. It is not the purpose of this conference to draft the Treaty of Peace in the only sense of that term. This conference will devote its energy and its labor exclusively to the single problem of setting up the essential organization to keep the peace. You are the right to fundamental charter. As the delegates broke up that first night, the task before them was clear, to chart the course toward realistic international cooperation to preserve peace. This was the responsibility vested in them by a war-weary world. It was for this they had gathered, at the invitation of the governments of China, Great Britain, the USSR, and the United States. This was the step made possible by Dunkirk and Stalingrad, and Normandy and the Burma Road and Midway, planned for at Casablanca, Cairo, Moscow, Tehran, Dumbarton Oaks, and Yalta. Delegates from 46 and later 50 nations were there. But there in spirit, too, were the victims of Warsaw, Coventry, Shanghai, Lidice. The hopes of the living and the dead were concentrated in the hands of the representatives meeting at San Francisco. Together they organized the huge problem ahead of them. discussion and amendments of the proposals prepared at Dumbarton Oaks. Each nation was represented on all four large commissions, set up to work out the general provisions of the United Nations Charter and the actual structure of the General Assembly, Security Council, and Judicial Organization. These committees were divided into smaller working groups, 12 in all. English, Russian, French, and Spanish were the standard means of exchange among many languages spoken. And in nine weeks, the charter was ready to go before the participating governments for ratification. In the General Assembly of the United Nations Organization, each member will have one vote. Any matters within the scope of the charter will be discussed here. Recommendations will be made to the Security Council. The Security Council will have five permanent members and six others elected by the General Assembly for two years. It is to be the enforcement arm of the organization. An international court of justice in permanent session will decide legal aspects of international disputes. The Economic and Social Council will have 18 members elected by the General Assembly. Special agencies like the Food and Agriculture Organization will be affiliated with it. The Trusteeship Council for the advancement of territories held in trust will be part of the General Assembly. It will be equally divided between those nations which administer trust territories and those which do not. There will be a secretariat to do the administrative work of the organization.
These provisions were not easily arrived at. They were hammered out of debate, stretched and contracted by compromise. The result is a constitution which is at the same time an expression of high ideals and of practical measures. To be effective, the Charter needs the active cooperation of people everywhere. The same efforts and understanding that went into the writing of the Charter will be needed to make it a working instrument. To fulfill the mutual responsibilities of nations as set forth in the Charter, to bring about free world trade and the full employment of man's productive resources, men and women of goodwill everywhere must come to know and understand one another. In this charter, humanity has declared its united purpose to work towards those economic goals. The Social and Economic Council of the United Nations Organization gives the peoples of the world an instrument with which to promote a higher standard of living everywhere. Through their delegates to San Francisco, the member nations pledge to use that instrument. They pledge, too, to stimulate the exchange of culture among people, and, in the words of the Charter, to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors. San Francisco, 50 United Nations reaffirmed their faith in the dignity and worth of the human person, without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. The representatives of 2,000 million people pledged to promote freedom from fear and freedom of expression, freedom from want, and freedom of worship. The second week of the conference brought the news of Germany's surrender, proof of the power of unity against a common enemy. and the price of total war, which would haunt civilization for decades to come. Strong and effective machinery must guarantee that succeeding generations shall be spared such destruction. Therefore, at San Francisco, the delegates of the United Nations took concrete steps to settle their disputes by peaceful means, to prevent threats to the peace, to suppress aggression, and pledged to place their armed forces at the disposal of the international organization. For speedy combined action, air forces will be held immediately available. Final responsibility is vested in the powerful Security Council, authorized to work swiftly and effectively with the aid of its military staff committee. This machinery was not designed without disagreement and dispute, but the final blueprint had the unanimous approval of the participating delegates. And it is now my duty, my honor and my privilege in the chair, to call for a vote on the approval of the Charter of the United Nations, including the statute of the International Court, and also of the agreement on interim arrangements. If I have your pleasure, may I invite the leaders of delegations 
who are in favor of the approval of the charter and the statute and the agreement on interim arrangements to rise in their places and be good enough to remain standing while they're counting. People's Conference, responsible to the conscience of the world. Here in the midst of war, the world's people collaborated in the drafting of a workable international constitution. It was a conference to write a people's charter, opening with the words, we, the people of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. conference and a soldiers conference, meeting under the eyes of veterans of two wars and the generation which must suffer if the Constitution failed. Common people and their governments alike were aware of the stakes. There were many who doubted that agreement could ever be reached by these 50 countries differing so much in race and religion, in language and culture. But these differences were all forgotten in one unshakable unity of determination to find a way to end war. This charter points the way. But whether the world is to move in that direction will depend, finally, upon the vigilance and sovereign will of the peoples of the world. <laughs>